It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, um, my question, uh, a very simple and straightforward question to the Premier. Um, Premier, exactly which taxes do you plan to raise in the province of Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition for the question and uh, just say to him that we are committed as we have said uh, for a number of months, that we are committed to building transit and building transportation infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker. We've been clear about that. We have stated that we will bring a plan forward in the budget, and we will do that, Mr. Speaker. And we will do that in we will do that in the fairest way possible. There will be a transparent fund, Mr. Speaker. It will be clear which projects we are going to build, Mr. Speaker. And we recognize that uh, in our urban centres and in the GTHA. Transit is a, a burning issue, Mr. Speaker, but we also recognize that in our rural and northern communities, roads and bridges and water systems, Mr. Speaker, those pieces of infrastructure are critical. So we're going to continue to build infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We're yes, going sir. to continue to make investments in this province, and I hope that the leader opposite will join us, Mr. Speaker. Well, if the Premier is asking if we'll support increasing taxes on families and job creators in the province of Ontario, absolutely not. I mean, here, here's the difference. You believe taxes should go up in the province. I believe they should come down to encourage job creation. <laughs> unfortunately, um, the Liberal record on taxes is a rather poor one, to say the least. Before elections, uh, Dalton McGuinty, um, or I suspect now uh, Premier Wynne, will say they're not going to increase taxes. And then you brought in the HST. You brought in the health tax. You brought in an income tax uh, increase. Uh, you brought in a business tax increase. And now we're getting very invasive answers on exactly which taxes you want to raise. Basically, you said you're going to increase income taxes again, but you said you're not going to tax the middle class. You're going to tax other income earners. So, Premier, maybe we could get some more clarity here and end the cat and mouse game. Um, well, how do you exactly define middle class when it comes to income taxes in our province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. While the, the Leader of the opposition, opposition says that there's a difference between us, and there absolutely is a difference between us, Mr. Speaker, there is a fundamental difference. And the difference is, Mr. Speaker, that we are Order. going to make and have been making and will continue to make investments Member in the people from Duffer and Calvin, province, come to order. We will continue to work with business and partnership, partnership, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to invest in infrastructure. What the Leader of the Opposition has put forward, Mr. Speaker, is, a, is a, a, what I would say is a non-plan, but it is an initiative that would cut and slash across the board, Mr. Speaker, that would slash services. And, Mr. Speaker, I do not believe that that is the member what from is North needed Fumble in this come province. To order. Right now, what we need is an aspirational plan, an understanding that investment in communities is what is necessary. That is what Answer. we will bring forward in our budget, Mr. Speaker. Two. Final supplementary. But the problem, Premier, with your aspirational plan is your only aspiration is to increase taxes and put us deeper into debt. Uh, I think that got us into a significant mess. Now, now Premier, you won't tell us um, how you're going to define middle class, but you are going to increase income tax. So I guess that is clear. I appreciate the fact you said there's a fundamental difference between you and I. I would agree. I just wish we saw a fundamental difference between you and Dalton McGuinty. Uh, it seems like it's pretty much two sides of the same coin. Uh, you also said that you're going to increase business tax. You're going to increase taxes on job creators in our province. In 2011, you said, quote, raising corporate taxes would create a chill in the job increases we've seen. Canadian Press, May 26. So at a time that a million people have no job in the province of Ontario, Premier, why are you considering increasing taxes on job creators or in 2011? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure uh, what I'm not sure what. Proceeded, please. please. Well, let's uh, let's give the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, an opportunity to stop, <laughs> and it will. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the leader of the opposition knows full well, we have cut taxes to small business, Mr. Speaker. Yep. We understand that small business needs uh, that support, and we have, uh, as recently as uh, this year, have cut the uh, payroll taxes for small businesses. Right. But, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> 
What we know at this point in our history is that it is very important that we make investments in the province and that we work in partnership with business, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That is not the strategy of the Leader of the Opposition. Right. He believes that cutting and slashing across the board yeah. is what needs to happen. We just don't accept that, Mr. Speaker. We believe that it is very important that we make sure that young people have the training that they need and that people who have lost their job have a way back into the job market, Mr. Speaker. And often retraining is what they need, Mr. Speaker. He also does not accept the notion that investing in transit and investing in transportation infrastructure in the immediate term creates jobs and in the long term creates economic prosperity. So that's the fundamental difference between him and me, Mr. Speaker. I believe that investing and making sure that that communities have Sir. the support they need, that that's what needs to happen. He believes that cutting and dividing is what needs to happen. Thank you. We don't accept that, Mr. Speaker. New question. Back to the uh, Premier. Okay. Speaker, well, here's the difference. I've got a million jobs planned to put people back to work in the province of Ontario. And you know, now here's the other concern I have. Part of our million jobs plan is make sure that we have a government that spends within its means, just like families have to do every day, just like businesses have to do every day. But um, my finance critic has uncovered senior Ministry of Finance officials that paint a very different picture of Ontario's finances from what you said, Premier, yourself in 2013. A Ministry of Finance document that you've seen says there are, quote, no plans in place to achieve out-year deficit targets from the 2012 budget. So there's no plan to balance the books. You say in your budget that you're on track to balance the budget. So if a, if a CFO or a CEO were found to be misleading its shareholders uh, on the finances, Answer they'd be fired. Our question. So, Premier, what do you think we should do with you? Focus, <laughs> focus. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the, you know, the leader of the opposition, had he taken the time to read the fall economic statement, he would have seen, Mr. Speaker, that the numbers get updated. And he also would know, Mr. Speaker, that on page two of that document, we said uncertainty in the global economy is leading to lower revenue growth. Ontario's revenues are more than five. I think you should hear this because you haven't read it. Ontario's revenues are more than $5 billion lower than projected since the 2010 budget. Mr. Speaker, we are constantly updating numbers. I think you already know. Thank you. And uh, let's bring it down. Finish, please. Government's responsibility to understand what is changing in the fiscal and the economic situation, Mr. Speaker. So, of course, we work with our officials, and there are numbers that are updated, changes that are made. We run scenarios, we look at options. That's how you develop a responsible policy position, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we are doing. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I, I uh, disagree, Speaker. I think that people expect the government to be honest with taxpayers about the truth, say the finances. But another, as you characterize it, fundamental difference between you and me. Um, you went further, Premier. This is not a, a one-shot occurrence. Um, there were several examples of how uh, you and the Minister of Finance said one thing and your financial officials said the other when it came to the budget last year. Your financial officials, we've now discovered, said for 2014-15 and 15-16, that the government is not on track to meet 2012 budget deficit targets. That's what the finance officials said. Uh, a few weeks later, you said the opposite. You said that you were on track. So people watch this closely. Not only taxpayers that are stuck with the bill, businesses that want to invest in this province, credit rating agencies. So if the Premier and the Finance Minister are saying one thing, and finance officials who look and crunch the numbers are saying the opposite, how can we actually trust Question. you in the province of Ontario? Isn't that enough to say it's time for a change in new leadership? Going to be honest about it. Thank you. Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I will just remind the Leader of the Opposition that we are the party, we're the government that passed a law that says, Mr. Speaker, that before a budget there has to be an opening up of the books. Before an election there has to be an opening up of the books because he will remember that when we came in in 2003 as a government, $5.6 billion, which had not been disclosed 
to the uh, province as a deficit, Mr. Speaker. But that's what we discovered when we came in. So we passed a law that makes it necessary, mandatory, mandatory for the books to be open before an election, Mr. Speaker. But I just want to make sure that people understand what the leader of the opposition is doing. He's taking material out of context from finance, finance officials, Mr. Speaker, materials that are part of a discussion with government officials, Mr. Answer. Speaker, in the development of a budget, in the development of policy. Had he read the fall economic statement, he would have seen that the numbers had been updated, Mr. Speaker. That's what responsible government Answer. does. Thank you. We update numbers and we develop a policy. Thank you. Final supplementary. Um, Unfortunately, Premier, uh, your shell game is up. Yep. Uh, people are on to the fact that you say one thing and do the opposite. Yep. Um, you told all of us you're going to be different from Dalton McGuinty. Um, I'm seeing more and more of the same. I'll remind you again, these are official Ministry of Finance documents from the run of the last budget, and I'm comparing what the finance official said to what you said a few weeks later in the budget. So not only were you inaccurate when it came to the deficit figures, you're also dramatically inaccurate when it came to the jobs in the province. Yeah. Ministry of Finance documents say, quote, the economy has not yet regained the strength of pre-2008. There are fewer jobs relative to our population and more unemployed. Yet a few weeks later, you said the exact opposite. Um, Premier, if you're going to invest in a company, if you're going to invest in a province, you want to know you're actually getting the hard facts, that you're getting the truth. One of the reasons we have a million unemployed in the province of Ontario is we can't trust you. We can't trust you. We can't trust Dalton McGuinty. Will you actually table a budget, be honest with people of Ontario? Or if you're not going to be honest with people of Ontario, just move aside. We'll come in. We'll clear the mess. We'll put people back. Thank you. Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I just I have to go back to the original original gamut of this question, Mr. Speaker, because because what the leader of the opposition is proposing for this province is devastating cuts across the board. We are being very honest with the people of the province that we need to make investments. We were honest in the fall economic statement when we said that the revenue numbers that we had anticipated had not been realized, Mr. Speaker, and that there is a revenue hole, Mr. Speaker. And we are going to work very hard to put forward a budget that will make the investments are necessary. Meanwhile, the Leader of the Opposition has, has said that he will cut, he has said, and his, his critic uh, for red tape as recently as just a few days ago last week said that regulations that were put in place after the Walkerton water tragedy said we have to take a look at the ridiculousness of regulations, yeah, she said. Mr. Right. Speaker, Answer. the radical and risky approach that the Leader of the Opposition put for, puts forward is not in the best interest of the people of the province, and we will not go Thank there. You. New question. Here is the third part. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Since she first took over the Liberal leadership from Dalton McGuinty, the Premier has insisted that it was absolutely essential for middle class families to foot the bill for transit and transportation expansion. And when anyone raised the concerns of families who are feeling squeezed like never before, the Premier told them they were behaving like children. She was having an adult conversation and she'd get back to us when she was done. Speaker, can the Premier tell us uh, what her view is this week? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, despite the tone of the leader of the third party, what I will say to her is that I said no such thing, Mr. Speaker. I have been clear that whatever revenue tools and whatever plan we brought forward was going to be fair, Mr. Speaker, that it was going to be transparent, and that it was going to allow us to continue to invest in transit and transportation infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. I have been clear about that from the moment I took on this job. And, Mr. Speaker, the only reason that last week I moved to say that it was uh, necessary to make it clear that we are not going to increase HST or increase gas tax, Mr. Speaker, is that there was a lot of mischief that was being created by members across the floor, Mr. Speaker, by identifying somehow the notion that we had committed to making those increases. We had done no such thing. We are committed to building transit, and our plan will come forward in the budget, Mr. Speaker. 
Do supplementary. Well, Speaker, I guess the Premier figured out that painting yourself into a corner is pretty darn mischievous. <laughs> the Liberal government has made it clear that they plan to move ahead with more corporate tax cuts and new loopholes. And they've also committed to scrapping the fairness tax, giving a multi-million dollar tax break to Ontario's highest income earners. New Democrats have been consistent. It's not fair to ask families to pay more while handing out billions in breaks to people who need them the least. Can the Premier tell us what her view is this week? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I have to say, and surprisingly, the NDP surprisingly has been consistent in not supporting transit building, Mr. Speaker. They have not been supportive in building infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. They have not been supportive in making investments that are necessary in this province. And I say, Mr. Speaker, that position I would have expected from the Conservatives. I would not have expected it from the NDP, Mr. Speaker. I would have thought that the NDP would have been interested in working with us to come up with a plan that was fair and that would invest in people and would invest in the infrastructure, particularly in transit and urban centres, Mr. Speaker, that so many of their members and so much of their history has been supportive of, Mr. Speaker. But that does not seem to be the case, and it's very disappointing that they don't support that kind of investment in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. You say that, please. Final supplementary. Well, I might want to remind the Premier that when she was Transportation Minister, she took $4 billion out of transit. Yes. And here's what people see, Speaker. Here's what people see. They see the same government that hit families with the HST in the highest hydro bills in Canada, the same government that bragged about their planned corporate tax giveaways uh, and had to be dragged kicking and screaming, Speaker, to bring in the fairness tax on high-income earners, the same Liberals who told families feeling squeezed that they were behaving like children when they complained about the idea of even more new taxes, now say that they have a plan to protect middle-class families. Do the, does the Premier really think people find her credible, Speaker? Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, um, when I was Minister of Transportation, I did not take $4 billion out of transit. We invested $4 billion in transit, Mr. Speaker. And the member, the member, the leader of the third party knows that full well. That was a cash flow issue. She knows perfectly well that those projects are underway. They are being built right now, Mr. Speaker. So I will say I believe that it is consistent with her party's past and their philosophy that she would be supporting the building of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that she would support the investment in this province, whether it's in infrastructure in Northern Ontario, whether it's in training programs, Mr. Speaker, that she would support that kind of investment. Unfortunately, that is not the case, Mr. Speaker. We will move ahead and bring a plan that will yes, put those investments front and centre, Mr. Speaker. Yes. I hope that parties on all sides of the House can support that plan, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier. Unemployment in Ontario is the same this month as it was last month, and our unemployment rate continues to be stubbornly above the national average. Does the Premier think her status quo job creation efforts are working, or will she look at something new? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think, uh, I think the leader of the third party knows that uh, there are jobs that are being created. And it's true, Mr. Speaker, that the economic recovery has not been as quick as we would have liked it to be. 100,000 new jobs have been created over the last year, Mr. Speaker. And she also will know that uh, in terms of youth employment, um, I think the update is over 9,000 young people have uh, placements, Mr. Speaker, because of the variety of tools that we put in place to help young people get a placement, Mr. Speaker. So I believe that we need to continue to bring businesses uh, to the province and we need to help businesses that are here to expand uh, investments like the support of Cisco, Mr. Speaker. That's the kind of uh, expansion that we want to make sure continues and we will continue to partner with business and continue to help create those new jobs, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, the Liberal and Conservative plan to keep generating more and more dead money with no strings attached giveaways isn't working. It's why Ontario continues to lag the rest of Canada when it comes to job creation. It's time to take a smarter approach, Speaker, one that we see working elsewhere. Is the Premier ready to admit that giveaways aren't working and it's time to reward job creators with job creation tax credits? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, as, as the leader of the third party knows, there are many businesses with whom we have partnered and who are creating new jobs. And, uh, you know, this is an issue of retaining jobs and expand, helping businesses to expand and to create new jobs. So, uh, 100,000 jobs, as I said, 100,000 new jobs have been created in the last year, Mr. Speaker. We've reformed our tax system and made it one of the most competitive in North America. And, in fact, we have done very well when you look at other jurisdictions in terms of regaining job loss uh, since the economic downturn. We're partnering with businesses through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, Mr. Speaker, and we are making progress on those fronts. So I, I look forward to the opportunity to uh, hear more from the leader of the third party. But Mr. Speaker, we are on track. Businesses are coming to the province, and we are recovering from the economic downturn. Final supplementary. Speaker, when Heinz pulled up stakes from Leamington, they went to a jurisdiction with job creator tax credits. A job creator tax credit ensures that we, we, we are rewarding the companies that are creating the jobs. When a company creates a job, they get a tax credit. When they invest in training their workers, they get a tax credit. When they invest in infrastructure for this province here in Ontario, they get a tax credit. When they invest they get a tax credit when they hire, they get a tax credit when they train, they get a tax credit. Will the Premier admit that her plan isn't doing the job and it's time to take a targeted tax credit approach to getting families working in Ontario again? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with the leader of the third party that we need to work with business, that we need to partner with business. Uh, you know, unlike the Conservatives who don't seem to think that working with business is what we need to do, I actually agree with the NDP that we do need to work with, with business. But I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that the work that is being done right now is creating results. So if we look at, I've talked about Cisco, Mr. Speaker, uh, but Ford and Oakville uh, securing 2,800 jobs. We invested $70.9 million, Mr. Speaker, and that leveraged a $700 million investment. In Toyota, we provided a grant of $16.9 million, and that will create 400 new jobs, Mr. Speaker. Original Foods Limited in Dunville, a grant of $1.5 million, Mr. Speaker, will create 150 new jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, we are working with businesses. We are making investments, partnering yes, with business. That is creating jobs, and the investments are tied to the creation of those jobs, Mr. Speaker, and I think that is a fundamental requirement of those investments that we make. Thank you. Your question? Good morning. My question is for the Premier in her capacity as Minister of Agriculture. Uh, Premier, I was proud uh, on Saturday to stand with uh, 400 people at Kempville Agricultural College to take uh, the first steps in building a new future at that campus. We had farmers, uh, college alumni, members of the community. At the meeting, uh, Robert Jelly who chaired uh, the College Royal at Kempville this year, expressed his profound disappointment that you've been essentially silent on this issue, uh, and you're the Minister of Agriculture. When Eastern Ontario's farmers and farm families needed their Minister of Agriculture to stand up for them, you weren't there, you weren't there for them. Oh, missing in action. These colleges in Kempville and Alfred are so important we need an educational institution east of Guelph. Minister, I'm asking you, members of our farm community want to hear from you. Question. Will you stand up for Kempville and Alfred and reverse that decision? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and I, I will answer the, the first question, and then I'm going to. I know that the Minister of uh, Training Colleges and Universities is going to want to comment on this because because it is an issue to do with the University of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. So I. I want to just be clear that we are very interested in finding local solutions. MPP, the MPP for um, uh, Glengarry Prescott Russell has been working very hard, Mr. Speaker, and a local solution has been found. Uh, Order. Phone college, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, stop. 
It's, uh, it's not helpful when things get uh, barked back and forth uh, when we're trying to get an answer and somebody's speaking even when I'm trying to say something. The member from the P in Carleton will come to order. Finish, please. And this Glenn Gary Prescott Russell will come to order. And the next person that says anything. Carry on. I understand the significance of the program in Kempville, Mr. Speaker, and I want I want that program to continue. And the program is not being cancelled, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the MPP, as I say, Gary Prescott Russell has worked to find local solutions. We are open to a local solution, Mr. Speaker. The program Answer. is not being cancelled. It's a matter of making sure that the program is viable and find working with the local community. Thank you. Well, Premier. I sp I've spoken to the Minister of Training and Colleges and Universities. I've spoken to your parliamentary assistant. Farm families and farmers in eastern Ontario want to hear from you. You know, if, I, if I'm to believe the Ottawa citizen this morning, your parliamentary assistant, Mr. Crack, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell, essentially agreed with me. I've got 5,000 people that have signed the online petition standing up for these agricultural colleges. We need a viable and strong agricultural sector, and we need to be able to teach innovation at an agricultural college close to home. Minister, are you going to stand up, agree with those 400 people and the 5,000-odd 5, 5, farmers, put a moratorium on it, support the college, don't dismantle Kempville and Elton. Stand up. You're the Minister of Agriculture. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I understand that we need to have this program. That's why the program's not being cancelled, Mr. Speaker. The program is not being cancelled. I just want to be very clear. And you know, I know as the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities has said, this is not a partisan issue. We want this training and these this uh, education process to go forward. It is not being cancelled. We are open to a local solution, Mr. Speaker. And the MPP for Mary Prescott Russell has been working looking for uh, for local solutions. And I ask the member opposite. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry will come to order. The member from Oxford will come to order. I know it was a male voice. Guelph is an autonomous organization that has the authority to make these decisions, Mr. Speaker. But I would ask the member opposite to work with us to look for a local solution. We do not. We are not cancelling the program. We want a viable solution, and I hope that the member opposite will work with us to find that local solution, Mr. Speaker. Question: The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My, uh, before I go to the minister, I'd like to congratulate all of the Winter Paralympic athletes on their huge successes in Sochi. Thank you, Speaker, to the Minister responsible for Pan Para Pan Games, for the millions of businesses, locals, and athletes participating in the games and living in the GTHA, and the expectation of a 20% reduction in vehicle traffic and a temporary implementation in the HOV lanes from Oshawa to Hamilton is unreasonable. In cities that already suffer from a horrendous gridlock, gridlock that even the Premier agrees already costs the local economy six billion dollars. Speaker, how can local residents Question. and businesses be confident that this government even has a transportation plan when the minister seems unable to provide any details? Thank you. The responsible for the Pan Pan Caravan American Thank you. Games. Thank you, Speaker, for the question. Speaker, another day, another drive-by shooting <laughs> of the Pan Am Games by the member opposite. Speaker, the fear-mongering tactic and negativity is not good for the game. It dampens the morale of our competitors. It takes away 26,000 jobs. It hurts our trading relationship with nations of the Americas. It hurts Ontario and Canada's 
repetition. Speaker, last week we presented a workable, achievable transportation plan. The member opposite acknowledged that he has no plan. Speaker, his allegation unfounded. It only muddies the water, and he has no credibility. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Quite an interesting response. Speaker, transportation and security are two extremely important factors to the success of this Pan Am Parapan Games. But it appears the government is more interested in creating chaos than thoughtful, detailed plans. No details, no plan means chaos at these games. At the rate this is going, these games will be known as the Pan Am Demonium Games. Speaker, what is going to take place, the government to create and reveal workable transportation and security plans for the 2015 Pan Parapan Games? There's no plan. Let's hear about it. Minister. Thank you. At the technical briefing last week, we were delighted to announce the 20 TO 2015 forecasted budget decreases from $1.441 billion to $1.392 billion, a saving of $49 million. Speaker, we have a comprehensive transportation plan. It is the work of more than 30 transportation partners led by the Ministry of Transportation. They are the experts. The plan includes best practices of past games in Vancouver and in London. Speaker, it is workable, it is achievable. Speaker, I'm glad that the member opposite came to the technical briefing this time. Speaker, unfortunately, it appeared he did not pay attention at all. Member opposite had no plan, only with unfounded allegations. He bad mouthing the game all the time. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Glengarry, Pascal Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. And yes, Speaker, it's true. Last week, the University of Guelph did make an announcement that they were going to be closing the Alfred campus in my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell and also the Kempville campus in Leeds Granville. But let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, as a, as a member for the rural riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell, I got to work immediately on this file, and uh, I found this decision very troubling as well. Working with the Minister of Agricultural Food and the Minister of Training, Com Colleges, Universities, Minister uh, Speaker, we came up with uh, a solution uh, that looks like it's going to be moving forward at Alfred, and we're doing the same thing uh, to have educational and research opportunities to continue at Kentville College. And I can tell you that I am very, very proud to stand up. And although the opposition will pretend to be the champions of agriculture, Question. Mr. Speaker, we have done our job on this side of the house. So I ask. Thank you, Be seated, please. Time's up. Be seated, please. The, uh, the House will come to order. I'll say it again. Uh, some people are pushing pretty hard, and I think I'll have to push back, including you. <laughs> Minister of Training, College and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, this has been a challenging issue in the members' riding and in Eastern Ontario. And I want to commend the member, Mr. Speaker, for his proactive advocacy and for stepping up, Mr. Speaker, to make something happen to help save the Alfred campus. Mr. Speaker, this is not a partisan issue. As the Premier said, this is a decision made by the University of Guelph, which is within their jurisdiction to make. But this member, Mr. Speaker, on catching wind of this, this decision, stepped up, picked up some partners in La Cité and La Borie College Boreal, who have signed an agreement, Mr. Speaker, in principle, to move forward and ensure that those pro programs continue at uh, College d'Alfred. I want to commend the member for his efforts, and Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the member, because I know he's working hard on the Kempville situation, yes, that we're open to solutions there, and he'll work with his colleagues on the other side of the aisle. He'll work with whoever he has to work with to try to find a solution Thank for you. Kempville as well. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. 
Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that very uh, comprehensive answer as to the work that we've done in the last week on this side of the House. Uh, finding a community-based uh, solution for uh, Alfred Campus in my riding to Glengarry Prescott Russell was a priority for me. But at the same time, Speaker, it was a priority for me to continue that we make sure that agriculture and research education continues at Kempville College. And I will continue to work on behalf of my constituents and the agricultural community across this great province of Ontario. But Mr. Speaker, in my riding, uh, 70 per cent of the population is francophone, and uh, the minister has alluded to the uh, member from Simcoe North come to order. In reaching an agreement and partnership with Collège Boreal and La Cité, and uh, I can tell you that francophone students across this province do have challenges in getting their post-secondary education. So I'm going to ask the minister, could the minister, could you please explain to us uh, what we're doing the government to ensure that francophones have the same opportunity as everyone else in this province to get their education in this province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure what the heck is about this. It's a very nonpartisan question. It's about Francophone students, Mr. Speaker, and their ability to experience their aspirations here in the province of Ontario, a responsibility that each and every one of us should take very seriously, and we do, Mr. Speaker, because we're improving access for Francophone students to get access to French language programs here in Ontario. This year, we've invested $84 million in French language post-secondary education. This represents a six 62% increase in funding for francophone programming since 2003. Last fall, we provided $2 million to Glendon College, College Boreal, and La Cité to expand their programs and services in growth high needs areas with the opportunity to partner with other institutions across this province. Mr. Speaker, this is important to francophone students. It's important that this government continue to stand up for those institutions and those students. Unlike the party opposite, Mr. Speaker, who's, who in the last platform considered La Cité and Boreal investments to be a waste. Mr. Speaker, far from it, these institutions are playing a Thank very you. important role in our post-secondary system. Thank you. Your question? The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This morning we revealed internal Liberal documents that prove you're telling the public one thing while the complete opposite is factual. You stood in this legislature and told us repeatedly that you'll balance the budget by 2017. The member from the PN Carleton will withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Carry on. In fact, the May budget document that you displayed earlier, you said you're on track to balance. Yet in newly discovered confidential documents, you were told last March that you're not on track to meet the budget deficit. You knew this budget document was wrong, yet that's what you told the legislature, the bond rating agencies, and the public. You had a chance to come clean with the financial community. What else are you hiding, Premier? Mr. France. Mr. Speaker, it took these individuals six months to get to page two of the financial <laughs> economic update. And they're now asking questions about something that we put out over a year ago that spoke very specifically and clearly about how we're recalibrating our spending in order to meet our targets. We are on track, Mr. Speaker, and we will stay on track, notwithstanding the challenges that we face. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Last time. And the, mem the minister responsible for seniors will uh, not be my armchair quarterback. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, we have become the leanest government anywhere in Canada. We are the lowest per capita government because of the work we have done. We've had some challenging times, and we made it very clear that our revenues are down by $5 billion. And notwithstanding that, we're making those cuts as necessary, and we're making investments that are even more important. Notwithstanding the fact that the federal Answer. government has cut funding exactly. only to Ontario, we will stand tall with the people of Ontario to meet those targets with or without those individuals opposite. Thank you. Thank you. Premier, on page two of that budget, you're stating a fact that only a month before you knew to be wrong. At the beginning of March last year, your government knew that you were $3.6 billion off the mark. So what did you do? You went and cut a deal with the NDP to run the credit card bill up even higher, all the way to what is now known to be, from your secret documents, $4.5 billion gap in the budget. 
The documents say it clearly. Cabinet retreat outcomes increase the fiscal gap. It's clear that you had your deficit widening deal with the third party already in place last March, and it's very clear that you have absolutely no plan to balance the budget. So, Premier, what fees and taxes do you have secretly cooked up to bring us back to balance? And is this budget deal with the NDP already done, like it was last year at this time? Can you say that, please? Can you say that, please? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan that speaks to investing in the people of this province. Exactly. We have a plan for strategic investments in modern infrastructure to create employment. The That's why we have over 600,000 net new jobs since 2003. And Mr. Speaker, the individuals opposite are only playing gimmicks. Gimmick. They're not any, at all. They're just talking about cuts across the board. Nowhere do they talk about how they're going to invest and stimulate economic growth. We have made a number of programs to reduce taxes, to maintain a dynamic business climate, to attract investment into our province. They are the job creators. That is who we stand with. They have chosen not to support business. We will. We'll support families as well to make sure it's fair to all concerned. Mr. Speaker, it's a balanced approach that's going to ensure economic recovery and more prosperity for all Ontario. Thank you. Question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Ontario families reacted with concern to news that natural gas companies are applying for rate increases up to 40 per cent. What is this government going to do to ensure that hard-pressed Ontarians are protected from unfair energy price increases that they just can't afford? Minister of Energy. Here, Minister of Speaker, across North America this winter, has been one of the coldest in the last 25 years. Exactly. The severe weather we've experienced has caused demand for natural gas and electricity to increase by as much as 25 per cent. The increased demand has caused natural gas prices to rise all across North America, Mr. Speaker. In Ontario, natural gas utilities pass the cost of natural gas to consumers without any markup. They do not make a profit on the commodity cost of natural gas but on their own distribution rate, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Energy Board, as part of its mandate to protect ratepayers, reviews these rates every three months to make sure they accurately reflect the cost of delivering natural gas to consumers. No increases have been approved, Mr. Speaker. It's before the Ontario Energy Board. Let them do their job. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Premier, people understand that it was a cold winter. Everyone knows that. But for families being squeezed, the news of natural gas getting more expensive is very hard to take. Yep. That, can the government ensure that these rates will be reviewed in a way that is fair, open and transparent, and will they allow families worried about the cost to have their say? Mr. Of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we have confidence in the Ontario Energy yeah. Board. They listen to submissions from the public from ratepayers groups. They listen to the industry when they make their decisions. It's fair, open, and transparent, Mr. Speaker. But I have a question for the critic from the NDP. What is his suggestion to reduce gas rates in Ontario? Please tell the people in Ontario how you would do it. Thank you. New question, the member from the Tropical North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I would also like to welcome the Association of Family Health Teams of Ontario to the Legislature. Their presence is especially appropriate, Speaker, as we have reached another 10-year milestone this weekend. It's been 10 years since our government established Ontario's first family health teams. I'm pleased to report that FHTs have been making a positive, multidisciplinary impact not only across Ontario but within my own riding of Etobicoke North. Patients report significant benefits from having access to select health care practitioners all at the same location and with an internal referral system. Minister, beyond my own riding, I respectfully ask you to share some of your insights on the broader accomplishments and contributions of family health teams across Ontario. Thank you, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, um, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for this question. And I want to say thank you to the representatives from the Association of Ontario Family Health Teams who are here with us today. I want to say thank you to the dedicated nurses, the doctors, the dietitians, the pharmacists, all of the other health providers that are working in our family, uh, family uh, health teams. We now have over 200 family, uh, family health teams, and Ontarians benefit from their skills, their hard work, their compassion every single day. 
Speaker, in just 10 years, we've gone from zero family health teams to 200 family health teams. That means more than 1,800 interdisciplinary health professionals are working side by side with over 2,400 physicians in our family health teams. It's a team-based model that provides uh, improved coordination and collaboration so that patients get the care they need. Speaker, three million Ontarians are benefiting from family Answer. health teams, including 700,000 who previously did not have a family doctor. Speaker, this is progress in 10 years, and we say thank you to family health teams. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister, for the insights, your review, and your dedication to this file. Speaker, it's been said that medicine is the most scientific art and the most artistic science. I think family health teams particularly embody this, mixing the right amount of evidence-based science with the right amount of delivery, care, and the humane approach, indeed the art of medicine. My own constituents in Etobicoke North benefit from Kane's family health team and the Etobicoke Medical Centre family health team. I was there for the ribbon cutting at the opening, and now we're serving 30,000 patients. So in your presence, Minister, in Parliament, I would also like to thank them. Yet there are still some people across Ontario speaker without a family doctor who are clearly, as you know, the best kind of doctor. So, Minister, I ask you, how are we increasing access to primary care across Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And, and I must say, primary care providers really are the entryway into uh, Ontario's excellent health care system. Not only do they provide care when Ontarians need it most, they have an important role to play in health promotion, in illness prevention, to keep people out of our emergency departments. Yeah. I'm pleased to say that, that 2.1 million more Ontarians now have a family doctor than in 2003, but there is still more to do. That's why we're training more doctors at home, we're recruiting more from abroad. We now have 5,000 more doctors working in Ontario than just a decade ago. Health Force Ontario and initiatives like the uh, Northern and Rural Recruitment and Retention Initiative ensure those doctors are going where they're needed. And Healthcare Connect helps yes, patients who don't have a family doctor find one. I remain committed, Speaker, to increasing access to excellent and timely primary care. Thank you. New question, the member from the P and Carl. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. Uh, when the House wasn't in session last week, uh, she snuck in through two expensive political appointments to chair Ontario's uh, power generation, uh, as well as the disgraced Hydro One. After the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal, the Premier promised Ontarians that she would take the politics out of the energy sector. Now we see that her former leadership rival, Sandra Pupitello, is going to chair the disgraced Hydro One. She apparently passed up the opportunity to be Ontario's finance minister, but she has no energy sector experience, with the exception of of, of allegedly gang tackling the former Minister of Energy, George Smitherman, over the Samsung agreement at a cabinet meeting. Now we understand Ms. Pupatello is set to make $150,000 a year or $3,800 an, an hour based on last year. Question. Now the question is who gets to pay for it? We all know that that's Hydro One consumers. So will the Premier share with us what the Premier has signed off Thank you. as a payment to Ms. Pupatello? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, we take the management of Ontario Power Generation and Hydro One very seriously. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have taken great care in uh, re replacing uh, the uh, two chairs of those two organizations. Uh, both existing chairs, uh, Mr. Speaker, have been uh, in office for uh, somewhere around 10 years. Uh, we explored all the possibilities, Mr. Speaker, and quite frankly, with her experience in government, uh, in cabinet, uh, she has as much experience as anybody else in the sector. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, she is very, very clearly going to work towards making uh, Hydro One more customer oriented. She has experience at doing that. She is currently, Mr. Speaker, the chair of the economic, the CEO of the Economic Development Answer. Corporation of Windsor. Uh, and as other senior corporate positions, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I find it uh, passing strange that the Premier would pass that to the Minister of Energy, who was one of uh, Sandra Pupatello's biggest booster uh, during the uh, during the leadership. Uh, the Pupatello appointment is just another bad energy decision by this government. Her severance just another long 
item on a very long bill for folks that are paying Hydro One. And we are continuing to pay for the Liberals' mistakes, whether it is the $20 billion that the minister brags about to, to communicate 1.1 per cent of energy on our grid through the FIP program, or it is the $1.1 billion cancelled gas plants to save the finance minister's seat. We have two out-of-control agencies at the OPG and at Hydro One. They continue to produce inefficiencies and incompetencies by the second. Propane and natural gas are going to be at all-time highs, and people in Ontario are going to be forced to pay for their heat and hydro or their grocery bill. The Liberal energy plan has failed. Will Kathleen Wynne stand in her place today and adopt Tim Hudak's plan for affordable energy in the Thank province you. of Ontario? You see the face? You see the face? Another reminder. Another reminder that we do not use uh, first names here. We use uh, titles or responsibilities, and I'd appreciate you adhering to that, even when you're making comments sitting on your seat, which you're not supposed to do in the first place. Minister of Energy. Speaker, I mentioned that we made two appointments uh, at the same time. One was to uh, the Ontario Power Generation, Mr. Bernard Lord, former oh. Premier of the province of New Brunswick, who comes to the job with absolute perfect credentials, Mr. Speaker, having experience in the electricity sector as Premier and having uh, had to manage those very, very uh, important uh, files. Uh, it's a credit to uh, us, Mr. Speaker, that we'd be able to attract uh, Mr. Lord. With respect to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is recognized by its peers across North America as having one of the top five distribution companies in the con on the continent, Mr. Speaker. In addition to that, they have totally rebuilt, almost totally rebuilt, and made more credible our transmission system in the last 10 years, Mr. Speaker. A transmission system Answer. which that government let deteriorate, so we were having outages and brownouts every single day somewhere in the province, Mr. Speaker. We're proud Thank of you. both of our institutions. New question, the member from Nickelback. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. For the past year, New Democrats and public health advocates were urging this government to take action Minister to prevent the environment, take paid plasma, plasma clinics from opening in Ontario. This advice was completely ignored by the Liberal government, and last week, the first paid plasma clinic announced that they were opening their doors. Tomorrow is the grand opening. Only then did we hear that the minister was going to take action. My question is simple. Why did it take her so long? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I am very pleased that uh, I will be introducing legislation that will make it illegal to pay for blood, just as currently it is illegal to pay for organs or to pay for. Uh, um, sperm or egg speaker. That's a, a pretty foundational principle and uh, recommended by the Creever Commission that we not uh uh, that we uh, that we have a volunteer-driven uh, blood collection system and plasma collection system, so we are moving forward with both regulation and legislation. I'm assuming the member opposite by the question will uh, support the speedy passage of this legislation. I think it is important, Speaker, to note that uh, that Health Canada unfortunately uh, said that it was up to provinces to uh, to make this decision province by province rather than Answer. having a national strategy. And once they made that announcement speaker that's why we're moving forward now thank you supplementary i really can't understand why the minister would wait until canadian plasma resources has signed a lease made leasehold improvement recruited their staff set up their clinics set up their donor and open their door to finally decide to make a peep about it and decide to close them down is it just me that think that they will may be legal action because of this tardy decision and who will pay for those legal action? Well, at least the minister admit that she was mistaken in not taking action sooner. Uh, speaker, I cannot speak for the business decisions of a company that had no license to operate 
in Ontario or in Canada. That was a decision that that company made. What I'm telling you, Speaker, that uh, yeah. uh, we believe that a license is required from the provincial government. They do not believe that. Uh, rather than having this embroiled in, in the courts, we are moving forward with both regulation and legislation to ensure that the principle of voluntary donation remains intact. It's a principled decision, Speaker. It is absolutely the right decision, and I'm delighted that the NDP will support it, and I'm hoping that the Progressive Conservatives will too. Thank you. New question. Member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of the Environment. As you'll know, Speaker, this is Canada Water Week. It's a national celebration of our nation's most vital resource. This week culminates with World Water Day this Saturday, March 22nd. Here in Ontario, we have the privilege of being the caretakers of the largest supplies of fresh water in the entire world. For the people of this province, the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence River Basin are vitally important for a high quality of life and their continued prosperity. They supply our drinking water, they power our towns and cities, irrigate our farms, fill our fishing nets, they provide hours of, uh, of recreation, relaxation, spiritual sustenance for Ontario families and visitors to this province as well. The magnificent lakes and the rivers and streams that feed them are one of the great economic Question. advantages we have in Ontario. Speaker, through you, could the minister provide the House with information on what the government is doing to help our communities protect our Great Lakes. Thank you, Minister of the Environment. Very timely question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our government understands the importance of maintaining a healthy Great Lakes ecosystem right here in the province of Ontario. One small but effective step that we have taken is establishing the Great Lakes Guardian Community Fund. This program offers modest grants to grassroots community groups for activities such as cleaning up a beach or shoreline, restoring a wetland, or planting trees to stop stream bank erosion. For example, we funded local groups' projects to improve fish habitat, wildlife habitat, and water quality in George Creek and 14 Mile Creek, flowing into Lake Superior and Lake Ontario, respectively. In fact, we've launched this program two years ago and since we've done so, we've awarded more than $3 million to 156 groups to make improvements in this Great area of Great Lakes. Actions like these in communities across Ontario add up, and that's why last week we invited nonprofit groups seeking funding for the Great Lakes projects to make their Thank applications. You. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question again for the Minister of the Environment. I agree we shouldn't take uh, the Great Lakes for advantage. But when I speak to my constituents about water, they're often speaking about the drinking water that comes out of their tap. Municipal and provincial governments have spent literally billions of dollars building drinking water treatment plants, training people to operate those plants, and making sure that the water that comes out of those plants is safe to drink. Safe drinking water in this province requires both substantial and adequate funding and persistent, filial, uh, persistent vigilance. Speaker, through you, could the minister provide the House with information on what our government is doing to make sure that the drinking water that comes out of our taps is, is not only safe for us today, but will also be safe for future generations? Great. What are you Thank doing? You, minister of the Environment. Again, a very timely question. Some in this House will remember what happened when the province let its guard down on drinking water protection. Budgets were being slashed willy-nilly. Drinking water inspectors were fired to save money. Well, money was saved, but lives were lost. Seven people died. Thousands were sickened. Walker proved that there is nothing as precious as clean, exactly. safe drinking water. I am pleased to champion the clean drinking water law and regulations right. that were implemented in response to the Walkerton tragedy. Some people in this House may not agree, but I think it's exceedingly important that all of us in this House remember the bitter lessons of the Walkerton drinking water tra tragedy. I hope that no member of this House will ever forget that and have tragic consequences for everyone. We brought in rules, regulations, policies, Thank you. and laws to ensure that Thank this you. will never happen again. The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, last week a group of Ontario standard bred horse breeders 
filed a statement of claim against OLG in the province. The lawsuit states that the cancellation of SARP was made with no Sounds prior like consultation or offer right. of compensation. It's true, and, that, and it's what we've been saying all along. Your government's conduct, conduct towards the industry is inexcusable. The NDP's indifference by allowing the 2012 budget to pass is inexcusable. Right. I asked the Premier, why should it take a lawsuit to force you and the NDP to pay attention? That's right here. Thank you, Premier. Very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, you know, I, I cannot speak to uh, an ongoing. Um, uh, legal situation, Mr. Speaker, and I won't do that. But I can say to the member opposite that my record on the horse racing industry, Mr. Speaker, is very, very successful. The Alliance Circuit, Mr. Speaker, and this is eight tracks Woodbine, Mohawk, Flamborough Downs, Georgian Downs, Western Fair, Clinton, Order. Hanover, Grand River, all have funding plans, Mr. Speaker. They all have a strategy in place and a funding plan in place. Um, Fort Erie has a funding plan. Rideau Carlton, there is a, a conversation ongoing. Ajax has a funding plan, Mr. Speaker, and Sudbury, Kawartha, Dresden, Hiawatha, and Leamington are still in negotiation, Mr. Speaker. So we are very pleased at the progress that we've made, Mr. Speaker. I've made it clear that the integration of horse racing with the uh, gaming industry is Answer. what needs to happen, and that is underway, Mr. Speaker. And those tracks will have a 2014 season. That's a success, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, I've spoken to leaders in the industry, and they tell me the Premier's spin is completely at odds with reality. Yep. It's not up to the course to sort this out. It's up to you, because you and the NDP made the mess. You need to clean it up. You have called for an, we have called for an immediate and permanent end to your so-called modernization plan that would build 29 new casinos while putting even more of the horse racing industry out of business. We would also re-establish a workable, transparent, and affordable slots at racetracks program. Why won't you? Here, here. Here, here. Come here. You see the face? You see the face? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the opposition is advocating for a return to a program that was not transparent, Mr. Speaker, that was not working, and I think he knows perfectly well that John Snowblin and Albert Buchanan and John Wilkinson worked to put together a plan that would be transparent, that would focus on the industry, Mr. Speaker, and would allow for the integration of gaming and the horse racing industry. So, as I said, Mr. Speaker, the eight tracks in the Alliance Circuit all have a plan, Mr. Speaker, for going forward. Um, we're under, we're still in negotiation with some of the other tracks, but Mr. Speaker, I'm very confident that the $400 million over the next five years that we are investing in horse racing is going to allow the horse racing industry in Ontario to thrive, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and will not, as the opposition would suggest, return us to a non-transparent and unaccountable plan. Thank you. Next question. From Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Last week, agriculture in East Ontario was dealt a body blow with the decision to close Campfield and, Agri and uh, Alfred Agriculture College. Agriculture education, it should be hands-on and site-specific because the process for learning, to learn agriculture, you learn it where you grew up, and a lot of those students are still going home to their family farm. But something else, farm folks, they understand hard budgetary decisions. But what they need is they need a chance to be able to help determine their future. Premier, Premier, you're the one person in this province who has the power to give those people a chance to help to see if they can save their college. You have the power. Will you use it? Thank you. Training colleges and universities. So training colleges and universities. Mr. Speaker, as was, as was responded to in previous questions, Mr. Speaker, the power to respond to this local challenge is found in, in the hands of the local people in those communities and the local members, like the member from Glen Gary Prescott Russell, who stepped up and got some local partners in, in uh, Collège Boreal and La Cité. To, to help ensure that those students at, uh, at the, the, the Alfred campus can continue to get the francophone uh, agricultural uh, courses that they want to pursue. Uh, and I've, I've reached out to the member, uh, uh, 
for Leeds Grenville as well to say, you know, we can do that, work with this on a nonpartisan basis. What we do need are local uh, local stakeholders to step up and provide this programming, Mr. Speaker, or find a way to yes, do sir. it. And we're open to those solutions, so we're happy to work with the member opposite. Should should he have some solutions to, to put forward? Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, my question or your sup is to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. This is a question for the Minister of Agriculture and Food, and we need more than a fair weather minister. Yeah. We need more than a minister who's just going to make great announcements when agriculture is happy. Right now, this area is in a crisis, and they're not asking for a bailout. They're asking for, they're demanding a chance to come up with a plan, and they weren't given that chance. Why don't you talk to the people before these announcements? And yes, the Minister of Agriculture can have an impact on this question. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite would be a lot more helpful if we were to get off the soapbox and get to work and see if he can work with us to find local solutions to this local problem. The challenge here, Mr. Speaker, is, and it's very important to say this, there is not a loss of programming here in the agricultural sector. The programming is moving to another location, Mr. Speaker, because in the interests of the University of Guelph, they've determined that that's what's best for their students, that's what's best for the growth of the program. At the same time, we recognize the local challenges that this creates, and that's why we're working very closely with the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell, and we'll work with the member for Leeds Grenville and other members, Mr. Speaker, and other community leaders to see if there's a similar solution available Answer. to the Kempville campus. We want to be constructive. We want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can to ensure the agricultural community is well served. In light of passage of Bill 156, an act to proclaim the month of January Tamil Heritage Month, I draw the members' attention to the fact that the opposition day uh, designated for this afternoon is identically worded in the effect section of Bill 156. Standing Order 52 provides that no motion or amendment, the subject matter of which has been decided upon, can be proposed during the same session. I must therefore rule that the motion designating Opposition Day No. 2 is now out of order and may not be proceeded with. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Leeds Grenville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with answer to his question given by the Minister of Agriculture and Food concerning the closure of Kempville and Alfred Agricultural Colleges. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, The member from Perth, Wellington, has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer of his question given by the Minister of Agriculture and Food concerning the horse racing industry. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. The uh, Leader of uh, Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition on a point of order. I appreciate your indulgence. I just want to introduce to um, members of the Assembly the bilingual political science class joining us from Glendon College at uh, York University. They're here, uh, good or ill, to see democracy in action today, Speaker. I want to welcome the students and wish them all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, on Thank point of order. Point of privilege, Mr. Speaker, if I could. Point of order. Point of order, sorry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government of the day continues to talk about working in partnership. I, I wonder why today they're out glad handing in my riding, handing out check. Stop, please. Stop, please. Stop, please. I stand. I st I'll wait. I stand, you sit. Thank you. The Attorney General on a point of order. Is it uh, in order to uh, ask for a late show before the answer has been given by a minister? <laughs> <laughs> the process is in place and it was, uh, it was appointed properly. The member from Barrie on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Earlier, the minister uh, responsible for Pan Am Games referred to comments made by myself and the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek as drive-by shootings. Oh. I believe this to be highly unparliamentary and very inappropriate. It's my hopes that the minister will apologize and withdraw. It's time for him to go. It's time for him to go. He's done.
While we, uh, while we do not condone any kind of language that would inflame, um, there were no specific references made to individuals, and uh, I would also caution all of us against using any kind of language that would inflame. And uh, find uh, finding, and I'll and I'll wait while I try to uh, respond. And I find that each of us need to uh, reflect inside, or maybe look in the mirror and ask ourselves whether we are being parliamentary. Minister of uh, Transportation. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I just wonder if we could take a moment to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. I wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. And, uh, maybe we could just honour it with the spirit of a bit of beer and a bit of fun. Thank you. The, uh, I, wish, I wish everyone uh, the best today. <laughs> There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.